Good evening and welcome to another developer interview here on the Perceptive Podcast and on Game Wisdom, where we are in science of games. My guest tonight is an industry veteran with a career spanning now over 30 years, working on a huge variety of games. He is currently at his own indie studio, Retro Ninja, and we're going to be talking about a whole lot of game design and what he's been up to. So please welcome to the cast. Tony Barnes, how are you doing this uh, pre-holiday season? We're in, we're like we're right on the cusp of the holidays. Oh, um, uh, hectic, busy. You know, uh, I've uh, I'm actually currently um, working as we speak, but then again, I'm always working. So <laughs> I, I know the uh, feeling. It's the holiday time, and for those of you watching this uh, recorder right now, I as soon as this cast is over, I will be getting back to uh, writing my next book. So there is no, I guess, like holiday weekend or holiday season for some of us. <laughs> no, I mean the the upside of working now, you know, like uh, uh, this is I don't mean now like this calendar time, but I mean now as in like now in my career is that I'm I'm doing it for myself. It's just like crunch. It's like um, yeah, am I putting in 12 to 14 hour days easily, um, uh, you know, seven days a week? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, but it's for me and, um, it's not because of someone else's decision. You know, mm -hmm. it's not someone else who were like, I made a bad decision or I saw some movie or some random game today that I want you to somehow incorporate, even <laughs> though it isn't even remotely what we were doing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's my fault or my decision. So it feels a little better to be putting in those hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the folks watching this recording right now, see if you can spot the uh, games that Tony has like a, a displayed above him uh, in the background. See if you can guess how many. Uh, let us know in the uh, description oh. or the comments down below there. <laughs> I don't know. There's. Yeah, there's a there's there's a bunch of stuff. I don't know. You probably can't capture it on on camera that well, but um, yeah, my wife, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, COVID hit. We're all stuck inside, and, um, and 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 magically that happens to also have been when I uh, left Amazon, decided to start my own thing because I probably should have been on my third uh, startup by now. But um, she said, you know, you should. You should be surrounded by your work, you know, so you can be inspired and and do it again. I say, yeah, sure, whatever, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm 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 surrounded by by my work, and the stuff up here is kind of uh, '90s era, um, so it's a it, it's very much um, a 16-bit plan in in this area right here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we certainly have a lot that we can discuss for our cast tonight, but to get things started with, Tony, since this is your first time on, for the people listening to us right now, could you talk a little bit about kind of like who you are and give us like an idea of what your background is? And the reason why I say that is I looked at Tony's site and he has a lot of game credits <laughs> spanning the last 30 years. So, whenever you're ready, yeah. uh, uh, be, uh, feel free to enlighten us. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm horrible, but I, I really need to update that site. As a matter of fact, it really is... Pro well, it's better than Moby Games, because Moby Games probably has about 40% of the games I've ever worked on. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, it, and, it, and it frightens me that some people think that's the authority to go to. Mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, um, Tony Barnes. Um, I've been making games uh, technically for 40 years now, um, uh, professionally for 30 37, 30, 37, yeah, something like that. Um, uh, but yeah, so I started uh, making games when I was 12. Um, and, um, you know, there were computers in schools, um, which doesn't seem like an uncommon thing nowadays. But uh, for a poor kid in the hood in the 80s, that was very uncommon. Um, but I was fortunate enough to go to a school that also had um, a lot of kids who their parents were alumni um, and they, um, you know, they had gone on to jobs at places like um, uh, like ILM and Apple and all that stuff. So growing up in the Bay Area, just, you know, to kind of tie that together, um, it helped 
uh, with exposure to machines. And um, yeah, sixth grade, they plunked apples in schools, apple twos. Nobody knew what the hell to do with them besides play um, Oregon Trail, uh, Gorgon, and Tube War or Tube Way. I can't remember. It was like a, a um, it was a Tempest um, clone, and um, and I was I was on my way. I was I wanted to do animation. I was doing stop motion animation in school, and um, again, you know, we had a kind of a robust uh, kind of um, uh, multimedia uh, kind of program, even though it was just, oh, there go the multimedia nerds, you know, um, but still within that, that program, within our little, little group of nerds, we had access to, like, I, I would, I learned how to cut, you know, edit, um, on a reel to reel, um, and, and I would cut scraps of, of takes of Star Wars because, you know, they were donated, things like that. So I I wanted to be in film and do animation. I wanted to be Ray Harryhausen, you know, Clash of the Titans and all that kind of fun stuff. Well, that stuff's great and everything, but um, it's time consuming. Um, and actually, anything that's worth its salt really is time consuming. But um, you know, when you're when you're 12 and you have to coordinate with a whole bunch of other people just to get you know your GI Joe guy to walk across the the screen and get shot. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, it's limiting. And then along come these computers, and you see, you know, the the pixels and the sprites moving, and I go, ooh, well, how does that work? Um, but nobody could tell me, you know, because it wasn't like anyone knew how the hell any of it worked. And the teacher just said, well, you, you have an interest, so have at it. Um, and would just leave me with the computer in math class. Um, you know, for 45 minutes straight to just do whatever I wanted. And um, one day I was running late and another kid uh, came in from the, you know, the next class. And um, and he had a game and it was like a kind of a maze game um, and uh, real simple, but um, it was amazing to me because he had made it. And I said, um, how, how did you do this? Um, and he hit the break key, which is a key on the keyboard that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> but it would break the program. It would stop it. And luckily for me, um, he uh, he hadn't written in a, in machine language, so he had written in basic. He hit the break key, and he typed list, and list will show you the program. Flies by all this text, <laughs> and it started flying by. He said, that's how, and then he walked away. Um, never to be seen again, like some sort of, you know, crazy uh, angel in some sort of after school special. Uh, so I, I basically deconstructed and reverse engineered his program um, to figure out how he's moving things, how he detected, you know, the walls and how um, he had a really simple algorithm for the, the enemy dot homing in on you and all that stuff. Um, but it wasn't simple to me at the time. It was like, whoa. Uh, but yeah, that's that's like kind of the first seed was um, seeing that I could move things without having to coordinate with some gigantic group, and um, with you know, and and it and it didn't take me months to you know move something across the screen. And once I learned how to do things like shape tables, I could have like more than a block moving around and all this stuff. So. Yeah, and like I, uh, I, I had mentioned earlier, I, I was like super poor, like dirt poor. So um, eventually I um, got a disc. I got enough money for a disc, uh, five and a quarter, uh, which, uh, you know, everybody calls floppies. And they're all floppies, um, whether they're hard or not, trust me. Uh, so um, I would make these games, um, and then um, I could save it. And I would sell the games for uh, lunch money, um, and which was good, you know, because a lot of times I would I would uh, uh, miss a meal. Which nowadays, um, yeah, I, I don't miss meals nowadays. But um, so that that kind of started my um, my whole thing of, of it being like a business, or I guess or something like that. It was like, oh, look, I can actually make money doing this. Um, so I really leaned in on learning how to how to make games, and I really liked the the response that I got from people when I would make something, and they were having fun playing it. 
fast forward to um, uh, 1985, um, I'm 15, yeah, 14, 14, 14, yeah. Um, and um, I, I would start actually writing my my programs down on a piece of note pa uh, note uh, pa book paper and stuff. I would write all my games on that because I didn't have a computer and all this. Um, so I had this friend of me. I call him a friend of me because he he only he was kind of like the Cartman of the neighborhood. He only really like had me around because um, because everyone else disliked him and he could um, make me feel bad about myself. <laughs> um, and so I would. I would write my programs down, and then I would write, I would go to his house, and he had moved um, from when we had first become friends, so he had moved like three miles away. So I'd actually walk to his house and then start typing in my stuff on his Atari. And the Atari was great because it had all these colors and all that fun stuff. <laughs> um, and um, and then I would you know go back home and think about what didn't work and whatever, and do this you know back and forth a few uh, you know a few times a week. Uh, till I eventually got a game, and, and the reason I call him a friend of me is because also he would like say, you know, I don't know why you're trying to make these little games. You know, you're never going to be anything. Um, and um, I, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let's fast forward to um, to like uh, mid '90s or something. I think I had just shipped Jungle Strike, and um, I had uh, gotten one of the few bonuses I've ever gotten in, in this business, and um, so I had. Painted my uh, I painted my car that I had at the time, a '68 GTO. I was going to get gas, and lo and behold, who's there as a petroleum expediter? Uh, but my friend of me is Guy Buen, and he was like, you know, what are you doing? How do you have this car? And I said, oh, I I bought it, you know, because I just finished the game. And he's like, a game? And I said, yeah, you remember those games that you know I was never going to be anything with? And I had it in my card from Electronic Arts, and said, yeah, so. Um, you know, that again, kind of like a TV show. Um, that's a, a good, re you know, a good revenge loop, a good, you know, <laughs> season ender right there. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I, I, I started and kept going with it because I really, and, and, and it's the same now, I really enjoy people's reaction to, uh, what I make. And, um, it also makes it a little tough, you know. Um, I don't think that gamers nowadays, like, there's so many gamers and just people on the internet in general that thrive on negativity. And, you know, it, it like, to them, it makes them feel alive to shit on you. You know, sorry, <laughs> you know, but like, and so, um, and they don't think that there's a person on the other end, really you know, um, for half of them. And then half of them, they do think there's a person and they're even happier to try and hurt that person. Uh, um, and a lot of my, my peers are kind of like, oh, don't worry about it, you know, like, oh, blah, blah, blah. But I, I, I can't speak for them and, and their motivation for why they got in the business and how they got in the business. But as I just stated, you know, one of the major reasons I got in the business is, um, is because I enjoy the... Um, you know the response from people, especially you know spe specifically just positive responses. If I if I make something and someone says, "Man, I love that game," or you know, I, I, nowadays I get people coming up and saying, um, uh, "You know, my my uh, my dad and I used to play your game." You know, I would sit on his lap while while he was playing Desert Strike or something like that. Um, and sure, does it make me feel old? Uh, sure, yeah. I tell you what really makes me feel old is working with someone and them going, um, I uh, I wasn't even alive when you made your first game. <laughs> like, oh, man. Mm. <laughs> that makes me feel old. Um, but, hey, you know, we all get older. So uh, I am older. I don't know if I'm old. Um, but it's great. It, it, it's great to be able to get that kind of feedback, that kind of energy. Um, and that's, you know, besides paying my bill, that's a large part of the reason I do what I do and why I, um, try to be so prolific is to, um, make as many things that touch as many people, you know, mm -hmm. positively, hopefully. Oh, yes. <laughs> Definitely a lot I can, uh, 
add to what we were just saying there, Tony, especially about kind of like covering games and being able to talk to people about them. As I was just telling uh, Tony before we started our recording, I've been doing game wisdom now for over just over 11 years now. So I've had a chance to talk to developers and like all places, all kinds of different uh, uh, studio sizes, what they can do and all that. And it never ceased to amaze me about what developers can do these days in terms of the games they're trying to make, their reach. And as you said, like, it, it, there is a person on the other end of, you know, whatever studio, whatever small project you're working on. And it's why, like, when I cover games, I typically, I never, you know, insult developer. I never say, oh, this person was stupid for doing this. Because, again, like, for people watch this on YouTube, you know there's quite a few YouTube videos about people <laughs> yelling about video games. And... One of the things I try to do is raise the discussion on what it means to cover game design and analyze titles. And it is something that, and I guess this will be an interesting question I want to ask you about. Again, with your career now over 30 years, how, like, like from, like, where you've been on the inside and now we're in studio, like, what has been your thoughts on, like, how, like, I guess, like, the state of, I guess, game analysis or studying games has like really like grown or has it grown because the reason why i say this was i started like writing about video games back in 2007 2008 and the whole reason i did this was because no one was talking about the games in the way i wanted to i wanted to find more about like design and understanding them and all i found were here are the next you know 10 great games for the holiday season or whatever mm -hmm. it's like well if no one's going to do it i'll I guess I'll start doing it, and it just <laughs> happened like that. Yeah, um, and that's a to me that's that's the the best attitude to have. If 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 you want something and no one's doing it, and then do it, and and that also means there is a uh, an opening, you know, mm -hmm. because what I've realized is um, as with ideas and everything, if it, uh, if one person wants it, many want it. It's interesting. There'll be people that'll absolutely shout me down on that, and you know, go to the comments and say whatever you want. That's fine. Um, but it's real. It, it, it's it's real and it's true. The more access you get to more people, you realize that um, if one person has has an idea about something, um, you know, I, it's hard to put a number on it. But let's just say there's there's at least ten thousand other people that have the same idea, right? Um, and and so, it, you know, go for it, do it, um, because somebody else um, besides you will will want it and probably appreciate appreciate you know what you're doing. Um, I certainly appreciate what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to your question, I um, it's interesting. There's more discussion about game development than there was before. Um, and there's game analysis. Um, I have kind of a love hate with that. Mm -hmm. I personally, like I said, I care about the gamer. I care about what they think. Um, a lot of my peers don't. A lot of my peers are like, whatever. We're just doing our thing, and you know that's 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 cool for them. I I live and breathe this. I'm twenty four seven games. You know, a a after forty years, it's really hard not to be like that but i realized you know early on that i was born to make games anyway so um it is it is what it is this, this is what i do so i care about friends i care about everything and i care about the fact that i feel there's a lot of hostility towards game developers um and it's been brewing for a while and again a lot of my peers are like stop tony who cares you know or whatever and I just shake my head when they do that because I say, you don't understand. You don't understand the small little seed that's been planted with this one little thing. And I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to you five or 10 years from now and I say, see, you know, and, and, uh, and see how it, how it's grown into this, this insane animosity. And here we are, um, where there's kind of a dismissal of what we do. Um, Everybody can make a game, or or like in or, or in my case, you know, 
Yeah. And I even get this from peers. Yeah, yeah, you're solo, whatever. There's still a team. I worked in teams. I'm not working at a team right now. I'm yes, I I am a unicorn. Sorry. Uh, mm-hmm. I I I program. I make music. I design. I uh, you know do it all. Um, I feel like it's a lack of education. You know, a lot of this animosity or a lot of like uh, kind of ambivalence to what we do. And and there's a lot of lip service going around right now. Oh yeah, your games are hard. Making games are hard, and people are starting to say that a lot. Um, and I'm happy that they're saying it, but like I said, I said it's kind of lip service because mm-hmm. they're saying it, and they don't really. Now they're just saying it. They don't understand why they're saying it. Um, so, I absolutely appreciate game analysis because I I feel like there needs to be education on on how games are made, and not just for gamers but um, also for uh, people who are actually working in our business. Because you can back your way into this business easily Ooh, yes. and then um, and, and not know, you know, not know <laughs> China and just kind of stumble your way through it. I think it's probably one of the most fake it till you make it uh, legitimate businesses out there. Um, and I, again, because I take, you know, I take my career and what I've done for forever and will do until I die, I take it very seriously. I feel like everyone should have some level of education. Um, and I, uh, and I, always, I always have this, this phrase, I say, dig in the crates, which is an old DJ um, uh, term where, um, you know, if you put on some song and, and you know, it makes the, makes the house move and everything, and people are like, oh, what was that song? And it's like, you don't know that song because you didn't dig in the crates. You didn't go into uh, the, the the milk crates that we would use to carry vinyl, you know, to the parties, and you wouldn't find the old Patrice Russian song or whatever it is. But then all of a sudden, P. Diddy did, and now he's making millions. If you had dug in the crates, you and 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 looked at uh, the original Metal Gear, you know, you would. <laughs> You would you would see those mechanics and you would understand them hopefully and then you break them down and and do something like my my uh, my game BPM Boy um, is um, is an homage to Marble Madness um, and then I also mentioned Super Monkey Ball because um, there's so many people that don't even know what Marble Madness is so I have to mention a more modern game that's actually becoming kind of on the outside also. There's an entire generation that doesn't know what Super Monkey Ball is. I can't say its influences are Marble Madness and Crystal Castle because they don't know what the hell that is because they don't <laughs> dig in the crate. Mm-hmm. I literally, I literally, I was showing the game and I literally had, um, I had more than one group of people come up and say, this is amazing, you've in- invented a new genre. And, oh. and it's like, it, it's a physics-based it's a roller. It's a physics-based, you know, marble rolling platformer. I just, I spruce it up by giving it a personality, um, and adding a whole bunch of funky '90s music. But it's like, you know, if you don't, if you don't look in the past, you know, you you're going to stagnate. So for people that are making games, it's important, I think, for them to understand and to look to the past. And for people who don't make games but want to um, be more than casual players, I guess, for lack of a better term, um, it'd be good if they understood at least at least be on the same level of understanding as a casual movie v- viewer. Like we're not even there yet. So I I I'm I I, I um I'm big on on video game analysis, but. <laughs> um, I see a lot of the majors uh, that are talking about it. Um, I subscribe to them all. Um, and I keep hearing the same thing over and over again. You know, if I have to hear one more time about the invisible tutorial on Mario um, level one, stage one, you know, um, I swear I'm going to scream <laughs> because it's like, you know, there's more to game design than that. But, but they don't. They don't because. They're kind of um, they're kind of enca- encapsulating Wikipedia pages and the same kind of looking at the same games over and over again and saying the same things over and over again. And so, glad that they're out there. I wish 
I, I, I wish that they'd expand um, their uh, curriculum, you know, for lack of a better term. But to do that, that means that you actually have to be active. You know, you have to actually um, go, okay, I'm going to go make a game. Like, oh, I can't remember his name. Game Maker's Toolkit. Um, there's a guy, um, you know, everybody listens to him. He's super polished and he's got the posh accent, so everybody listens to him. Luckily, what he's saying actually um, uh, makes sense. But I'll be real honest, and I'll probably get some hate mail for this. I don't 100% like him. Um, or I didn't, um, because I'm sitting there listening to this guy, and I'm kind of like, yeah, that's cool, but you have no idea, homie. You have no idea how hard it is to do what you're talking about. I mean, you, you say you do, but you don't. Um, and luckily uh, for him and for his viewers, um, he has embarked on making a game, and he has found out that a lot of the well, that's obvious. Why shouldn't this be like this kind of like <laughs> comments and things? Um, I think he's got a better understanding and a better appreciation of why certain things ended up the way they did in games and all this. Um, and I feel like almost like, you know, like how some countries have um, military service as compulsory. I almost feel like video game um, development should be compulsory. <laughs> it, it, it should be like, it's a shame that our education system in 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 um, America is just so flu bark right now that and there's no there's there's no room to insert such a thing. But I wish that every kid had to spend you know at least a semester making space invaders or something, mm -hmm. um, because um, you learn so much. Like I've um, told um, people who ask me, you know, what should I do to get in a business? How do I do blah, 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 right? And, um, I, I, you know, I point them to kind of the usual suspects, grab an engine that starts with a U. Um, if you're doing something that's 2D, grab an engine that starts with, with a G. And, you know, um, get making. Like, go and make something. Oh, uh, but what I, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I say, you know, all the butts, if you're putting in your way, um, you're, you know, unless you swim through that, you're never, ever going to make a game because you're stopping yourself at ground zero. You think that having an idea is like, that's the thing, you know? And I mean, I'm, I, I've been a game designer, game director for, you know, countless years with, with teams. And it's not about the idea. It's about the execution. I always say um, ideas are free and execution costs. And it's because um, everyone has ideas. You've got to learn how to put those ideas into practice. And, um, go through it so that you uh, step on that landmine. Man, I, I, it's amazing I can even walk how many landmines I've stepped on in my career. Um, but what but what happens is I don't step on them again, you know. Um, you learn the lesson. So me getting out there, making something simple, take your simplest idea, cut that in half, and then realize you're only going to do half of that. Um, but really, you should start with, like, Space Invaders, Pong, Pac-Man. They sound really silly by today's standards, but, I mean, really, most games you can boil down to... Um, those archetypes from the early 80s anyway um, as far as core mechanics of what you're doing. So start with those, make one of them from end to end, and you will learn more about game design, game development than any core to teach you. It, it you know, like, no offense to the schools, um, but, like, their process is um it's very much about like kind of team building um you know everybody gets a role in the team and and you guys kind of kind of scratch your way through um some sort of game jammy kind of thing and all this but i i find a lot of people that come through the schools um it's 
they're good at integrating into teams where there's a large amount of structure around them, you know, to keep them moving forward. Uh, but it doesn't teach autonomy, really. It doesn't teach, like, you're not getting a lot of solo devs uh, from full sale. Not really, not, not ones that are, like, not, that are ready to run. Um, you're not getting, you're not getting um, a lot of um, successful indie uh, dev um, or even smaller, you know, what we used to call AA or whatever, big, big I indie, because, um, because of the way their, their thing is structured. Really just want to sit down and go, all right, I got a weekend or I got a week, whatever, whatever it takes you to make Space Invaders. Just make Space Invaders and, and see how it goes. Mm-hmm. Sorry, <laughs> I went off on a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> that is all right. Again, really great uh, conversation and really great points there. And like to go back to what you said like a minute ago about, I guess, like trying to understand or grow your analysis of games. Like one of the challenges that I've seen, and like what you were saying, like with like Game Maker's Tool can a lot of people color games, is that they tend to only focus on, you know, like the does, like study Super Mario, study Doom 1, study a game that has been, you know, ripped apart, digested 10,000 fold. But one of the things I like to do with, like, one thing I'm doing with my uh, deep dive books and what I do here is I like to look at, well, I of course have to bring on major examples. I just did a video about how to learn 2D platformer design. And of course, I mentioned you should obviously play Super Mario World. It is, again, a game that has its foundation has been, you know, studied for years. But I also say, well, here yeah. are some new indie games to check out. Here's what someone new is doing in 2022 or 2023. And I think a lot of people... And I'm curious what you think about this point. Like, I feel like a lot of developers sometimes take too much of that inspiration from, like, the classics. Like, they view the classics as, that's it. Like, you know, Super Mario World did it right, and that is all you need to do to do a platformer. Or just study Doom 1, and that is your perfect first-person shooter. And what I see that ends up happening from like a lot of like first time developers, even those who like have had experience like working in major studios, they go in the mm-hmm. independent space, they make their first game, and it just feels overly bland. Like it feels like someone just took a spreadsheet of this is all the first person shooters. I will just take these three points. This is my first person shooter, or this is my platform, or this is my real time strategy game, whatever. And then, right. one of the things that I found very fascinating is that I've, like I said, like a lot of my coverage over the past seven years has been focusing more on independent developers. I have interviewed developers who, very first game, whether, you know, something they just made while they were in high school or just got out of college, you know, year one after college, they decided to make a video game. And it's better in terms of its design than something that I've seen from a studio that says, we're industry veterans from blah, 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 and we have combined 27 or 50 years of game dev experience. And all yeah, they yeah. did was just make, okay, here's an Unreal Tournament clone for the umpteenth time, or or here, you were talking about people, <laughs> uh, again, like, here's my favorite, like, tired point, when everyone's trying to make another extraction shooter or a Battle Royale. Because that was what it was yeah. like, like, four years ago. I got, like, developer sent me interviews saying we're gonna make the latest extraction shooter this is gonna be the battle royale to be fortnite and then i never hear anything else from them ever again after that last email they died in extraction hell (laughs) um yeah you know it's um yeah uh, i i have to figure out how to say this for my AAA brethren. Um, AAA teaches you how to survive game development, not necessarily how to thrive in game development. Um, especially the more major um, studios and publishers that you um, can end up at. I mean, I've worked for most of them, so I speak from experience. Um, and I mean, everybody loves to hate Electronic Arts. Yawn. Um, 
you know, electronic arts um, in the uh, early 90s, the 80s and the early 90s, the drastically different place than it is now, or was. Um, and um, I, I absolutely appreciate the things that I was taught at electronic arts. Um, it's important to know, like I said, how to finish. You know, if it doesn't go in the box, then it doesn't matter. So um, it's important to learn that. But um, yeah, you can you can warm a chair for a long time, and um, and then you you kind of um, um, you kind of become numb to. Uh, I hate the word innovation. Let's not use that word because that word is loaded with bullshit. Um, but um, your own voice, you know. Well, so big studios, um, especially nowadays, uh, aren't about individual voices, right? Um, and um, your imagination is um, within the box, right? Someone defines the box. And nowadays, especially with big, big, um, big studios and everything, um, the box is defined by the trends. Uh, and unfortunately, the people that are looking at the trends are always chasing instead of getting ahead of them. But you know, that's another thing. So you're defined in this box of chasing already. Um, and then it's like, now give us something that's better and innovative, right? They throw the innovative word out. So there's, but if you get too innovative or too interesting, then it's like, well, you're out, you're, you're not in that box, right? <laughs> so you, you can become very good at surviving game development um, at, at larger studios or even, you know, medium sized studios that are, that are chasing. Um, and so when given your own kind of like freedom, you know, and, I have George Michael's freedom running through my head now. Um, then uh, one of two things happens. Um, either go completely off, like, and it's like, holy crap, where'd this come from, right? Which can be good or bad. Um, but what, whatever, that you know, that that's your voice, right? Um, or um, you're still kind of, in the institution you haven't really gotten out of shawshank yet and so um your practices on how to generate something is still based upon having you know uh 40 50 100 many hundreds of, of people um and having these type of milestones and all that stuff it's still it's like it's baked in your brain and i mean i speak from experience because when i started I started as myself making games 45 minutes and then, you know, ooh, making a game for three days and then, you know, it, it grows incrementally, right? Um, but, you know, you take something like, uh, like Jungle Strike. Jungle Strike was, well, 14 months, something like that, right? Um, and, you know, in, in today's world, a triple A, because it was triple A at the time, uh, a triple A, um, major release from a, a major publisher that you know sold some 10 million units wouldn't be done by 15 people <laughs> in a year. You know, there'd be all of this infrastructure and everything just surrounding around it to make sure it was okay. Um, and versus what we did, which was, you know, we had a team and literally I, you know, slept at my desk and, and would slip in whatever, um, whatever I could, because um, the powers that be at that point were like, just go make something, you know, make the sequel to something that's already sold, go make something more, make us more money, right? They didn't really care. They trusted us. Nowadays, there's too much money and too many things in, on, on the line to trust so much um and so like i said you come out of all of that and you have learned a lot but you've learned some bad habits right at least bad habits when it comes to picking out on your own and going i'm going to do the next thing and it's going to be my own thing um you know and so it's people need to um they need to figure out how to get over that, and hopefully in the cheap seats, 
uh, the cheap seats I call is like pre-production things on paper when things are just ideas and you're not spending money on them. You're not, you know, you don't have a crew sitting around. You're not spending money on outsourcers or whatever it is, you know, as long as it's down to just the burn rate of a person or a couple of people, um, I consider that still the cheap seats. Um, but a lot of these places, I can't count how many times a day I have to read that someone just got $20 million because they had a, their name uh, on a credit of a some AAA hit thing. Um, and then uh, a few months later, um, blah, blah is folding, you know, or they released their, their early access and um, it didn't hit. And, you know, that studio is dead now. And it's like, work it out on the cheap seats. Work out um, breaking the bad habits. Um, you can't take, you can't take uh, an idea that's like supposed to be breaking the mold or doing something interesting, um, and take you know twenty people and um, and use the same methodology that you've been taught uh, by by gigantic mega AAA team Arama. Um, you have to break those bad habits. You have to also break the habits of um, uh, and this is something I struggle with all the time, like uh, right up to like right now, which is uh, what will my peers think? Um, that is it, that could be crippling. Sitting there worrying so much about what other people, you know, other people will think, especially your peers. Oh, I broken out on my own. They're gonna, ex you know, want to expect me to to. Um, you know, reinvent the wheel and, and run the world and be a maze ball for all the you know the first shot out, and 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 the whole time that they're going to um, slam me for not being amazing, they're also going to be playing uh, vampire survivors and and not not understanding the irony of loving that game but crapping on my my thing that's you know got all this polish for no good reason. <laughs> so. <laughs> You have to really, um, you have to break these habits. You have to get over it um, to really break free and to to just do something interesting that's really you, you know? Yeah. Otherwise, just stay somewhere and collect a check. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it is very difficult, I think, for a lot of developers. As you, what you said was a really good point about it. For a lot of people, when they're on their own for the first time, there's that idea of, I can literally make anything I want. So why don't I make a uh, racing platformer, survival horror, extraction shooter, uh, a star citizen? Because no one's ever done before. I can do it and it'll be this amazing game. But one of the things, again, as someone who's played so many indie games, I've seen so many indie projects over the last 10 years. I've played those games. I've played when someone just goes, you know what? If everyone went over there, I'm building my game by running, you know, screaming in that direction. And there may be, like, a kernel of a great idea here, but sometimes it just comes off as just, like, I threw everything in the kitchen sink. Why doesn't my kitchen sink work anymore? And it's one of the reasons why I think it's very important to study design, not just, again, like, the good games, but the weird games, the games that didn't do well, because if you don't understand why something doesn't work, like to your point earlier about stepping on landmines, I've seen so many examples of that from developers. And again, sometimes it's from, you know, a, a first year student or someone just making their first project. But then I see mm -hmm. this from someone again, like a studio made up of, you know, we worked at every major company together the last 15 years and their first mm -hmm. person shooter feels horrible or they're you know, mm -hmm. survival sim, you know, everyone trying to make the next Daisy or the next uh, Minecraft. That was another interesting mm -hmm. point. It doesn't really work that well. And it again comes back to this idea or this understanding of why did someone do this? Why was this in a game? Why wasn't this in a game? And if you yeah. don't figure that out, you just end up you kind of like only understand like half the story. Like, yes, Mario yeah. feels good to jump, but why does he feel good to jump? Like, you can just say, well, I like pressing the A button. 
oh, okay, so how are you going to translate that into making your own platformer? Or making yeah. your own shooter? Or your own... Uh, oh, we were talking about, you mentioned Vampire Survivors. I have lost count at this point the amount of Vampire Survivor, Bullet Heaven, Reverse Bullet Hell, any other adjectives you can think of. Uh, games uh -huh. that I have played in the last two years now. Oh yeah, I'm sure. It's funny um, when I when it first kind of showed up. Um, good lord, I don't know. It was over a year ago, and um, like I said, I, I I watch everything. I kind of keep my eye on everything. The AAA stuff takes care of itself, so I don't have to go seek it. It'll come to me. Um, but everything else, I go and look for. And um, I see Vampire Survivor, and I laughed and scoffed. But here's the thing. The last time I laughed and scoffed at something, um, it was this little game called Tetris. Uh, it was being shopped around, and um, it was it. I, I was at a place called Antic, and we uh, published uh, magazines and we published software for the Atari, um, you know, Atari Eight Bits and the and the STs, and then also got into the Amiga and all this stuff. So. They were shopping in the Bay Area. I walk up, and everybody's gathered around, and I said, what are we looking at? And uh, my boss uh, said, uh, we're thinking about, you know, uh, publishing this game. And I looked at it, and because I was a 17- or 16-year-old punk kid, um, I said, this? I can make it in a week. And my boss was like, the kid said he can make it in a week. So, um so they passed on, on Tetris. Um, and uh, so, you know, strike one. Uh, <laughs> strike two, I did make, um, I did make this uh, stupid thing called Blocks. Um, and I made it in a week. And I did not understand what I was looking at with Tetris. I looked at it. I touched it for a split second and then said, yeah, got it. I'm good. <laughs> I'm amazing. I'll do this. And I did. But I said... You know, this game, um, what's with, it, it's not taking up the whole screen? Like, why are you wasting all this screen space? So I expanded the size <laughs> of the well, and then it's like, it only has like a handful of pieces when you can make all kinds of shapes. So I made all kinds of shapes because I'm an idiot, and it wasn't as fun. I didn't understand why it wasn't as fun, um, because um, I, you know, I had ego and head up ass syndrome instead of actually <laughs> sitting there and actually... A, um, analyzing the game so um, I'll never forget that um, and you know um, a mistake is only a mistake if you don't learn a lesson from it so I decided to learn the lesson which was that I should not be so arrogant as to look at something that simple and assume I can make it assume I can make it better um, and to not actually sit and analyze why um, why is this thing so popular? Why do people care at all? Um, and so when Vampire uh, Survivors came along, um, the initial thing, I just kind of went, eh, whatever. Um, and then it, it started to get popular. And, uh, um, and I said, okay, here we go. Okay, I'm going to have to play this. I go to play it, and I said, oh, my God, every single thing about this is what they tell you not to do. Like, the, again, the bad habits you have to unlearn. It's like from the fatal screen, from moment zero, it's it's just not what any any you know professional studio would would do. Um, crunchy resolution, the music, um, it doesn't tell you what what the hell you're doing. Um, the the slow burn to actually get to the point where it becomes addictive it's amazing to me because most people don't have time and won't spend the time to actually get into something and soak into it um so that that part of the phenomenon actually amazes me that that um somehow it, it got over the hump and became popular and gained momentum but yeah um me all you have to do is look at the clones you can look at the clones and it's and there's clones that are on the surface, uh, better, you know, like they look better, or maybe they're more a theme that you're into, like, you know, maybe you're not into, into, um, 
pseudo Castlevania sprites, you know, maybe you're into spaceships, right? <laughs> um, and yet they don't work. There's a few that do, you know, um, but most of them don't work. And it's, and it's, it's the Tetris thing. It's the glanced at it, got it, you know, and especially nowadays, oh, I downloaded a template, you know, for half of them, they're out there. Um, <laughs> And then you and then you shove this shit out, and it's like no, 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 no. You really have to understand it, and whether it be by accident or just being diligent, um, Empire Survivors is tuned. It is well tuned. I, I've played it and like you know reverse engineered what's going on, all this stuff, and the way that the timer for the spawns. And kind of the way, the direction that they're coming from versus your direction and all this, all of these things, um, like I said, whether it be from constant tuning and playing or whether it be the person that made it, who I surprisingly don't know and haven't taken the time, but I will find them and talk to them eventually. Um, it's intentional, right? Like, it's not, when you're playing it, it's not like, by accident what's happening to you on a moment-to-moment -moment basis but a lot of the clones are accidental you know if they're hitting the mark um because the person that made it did not understand they did not understand the subtleties of what was going on in that game they just said "Ooh, looks simple i should clone it um and really quick you mentioned mario and the jump right so um I was uh, 14, I think it was, yeah, 14, and was walking through um, uh, FAO Schwartz, which is a, a, a toy store that I'm not sure exists anymore. So it was a really upscale toy store, um, kind of like the one in the movie Big, um, which I think that's, uh, that may be Schwartz or it may be Gimbal's. Um, but anyway, um, I'm walking through Schwartz, and um upscale toy store and um i just hear booming out of these speakers do 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 and i stopped in my track um because uh uh like i had never heard like that bass line or anything and i turned and there was a nintendo with the robot back then because they're trying to kind of sell it as like a whole toy thing um um, but there was a Nintendo NES, and it was hooked up to these, like, you know, uh, at the time, they were, like, $200 Harman Kardon speakers, which would be, like, $800 nowadays, um, and, uh, and a subwoof, <laughs> and so, of course, I'm going to stop for that, and I look, and I say, oh, that's the guy from Donkey Kong, right, <laughs> um, and I moved him with this newfangled pad thingy. But, you know, we were really open to any control at that point, to be honest. Like, I mean, most people had joysticks, but we didn't care. Whatever. Everything was kind of experimental. So I'm moving around with this pad thingy. I'm not thinking of it. And the movement's fine. And I hit the jump button. And something was like, wow, that jump feels great. And so I just sat there. I sat there for... I don't know how long, but eventually somebody came like, hey, kid, move along. <laughs> I just was like sitting there tapping the jump button, holding the jump button, running and jumping, you know, and all this fun jumping stuff. Um, so then I go home because I've already been making games for a while. Um, and, and my favorite genre at the moment, uh, that, at that moment was platformer. So um, I, could, I could squirt out a platformer literally in a day. And I sat down and I wanted to make. Um, what I felt, you know, I wanted to make a platformer that felt like that. Not necessarily the scrolling, because that was beyond my my abilities at the time, but um, definitely running and jumping and feeling that good. And I I spent probably longer than I had on any sort of core mechanics at that point. I spent three days and could not get it not feeling too horrific. <laughs> and um, so what I did was I said okay, I can't do that, and I don't know how they're doing it, 
um, and of course it's easy to know now, you know, but um, at the time, no internet, nobody to talk to, nothing. So uh, what did I do? I made three games, all platformers, no jump. <laughs> I said, screw this. Um, if I can't do it as good or better, then I'm going to try something different. And so I made um, I made three platformers, no jump. Um, and two of those three platformers um, were published in what got me um, got me my first professional gig into the business. You know, in in 1985, um, got me um, got my foot in the door. And so I think that, like for a lot of people. Um, we have a, we have access to tools and information, and you have access to everything that I've done and everything that like you know my mentors like Steve Cartwright did and all that fun stuff. So you don't have the constraint. I feel like constraints breed creativity, um, and sometimes people should probably take a step back and actually put themselves in a box and say, okay. You can make anything you want, but it can't have this, this, or this, or it has to fit in this or whatever. I mean, I also come from like the demo scene um, on the Amiga and the Atari 664 and all that stuff where, you know, we'd make bouncy, scrolly things uh, um, that fit in 4K. I mean, you can't even make a desktop icon for the 4K. So, um, but these constraints, you know, like I said, they breed creativity. They make you, they force you uh, to figure out crafty ways to do what you want or to give up on what you want rapidly and go, okay, I'm going to do this other thing. Um, and when it comes to like modern game development and kind of keeping on track, um, I feel like people, um, when they come up with an idea or you ask them about their game, they usually start telling you a story. And I mean, that's cool if like your, your mechanics are zero or, or, or close to zero and it is all about just the narrative uh, but if you're talking about a game game um, and it doesn't have to be an arcade game it's a game it's like even if you're talking about I don't know gears or something it's like okay what do you do right um, and and if you know what you do um, from from moment to moment can you figure out uh, um, how whatever it is that you do, you know, the mechanics and everything, how does it feed back into what the game is, right? Because um, I'm real big on intent. So um, a, lot of, a lot of people make stuff, you know, uh, whether it be a game or even if they're working in a team and they, have, they feel like they have some understanding of what the overall game is, uh, but it, when it when you break it down, they don't because the the thing, the individual thing that they're making doesn't fit the overall theme. You know, they don't have any intent behind it. Uh, while working on um, Medal of Honor 2010, uh, which used to be called Anaconda, I like that name a lot better than slapping a number on the end of the game that's already been made. But whatever, um, we're working on this game, and we're working on encounter design with the designer. And a lot of the designers that just kind of come from, come up through the ranks and come from that, um, here's your space, go make something in that space. You know, put some spawners down and make it happen, right? Um, and I would have these discussions and say, okay, so what is this supposed to be? Um, and some of them even knew like high level terms, like, okay, uh, this is a defend, right? Um, so a defend is where someone posts it up and there's um, and they have to stay you know in a in a specific position um, while waves of enemies come at them you know either through timer or number of or whatever right so that's at at its highest level that's basically what a defend is right but I'm like no 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 what is this supposed to be like what is the intent here um, and the designer couldn't tell me. Because he'd never he'd never been challenged that way, he'd never thought about games that way, never never thought about it at all. And which is crazy to me. If you can play someone else's stuff, or you can watch someone else's thing, and um, and get uh, you know get feelings from it, and um, say that was great or whatever. And it's your job to make games. 
you sure as hell better be able to break down. You know, once once you're out of it, once you're like, that was awesome, then step back and break it down and go, why was that awesome, right? Um, if you can't do that, you're just a passenger in the car. You're not driving. You're just you're just along for the ride. And so I said, okay, here's the deal. This defend is about making the player feel fear. It is about making them feel like they're going to die. And this was right after Call of Duty, where Call of Duty did, you know, the bold thing. They killed the player, and, and they nuked everything. <laughs> um, and that was, you know, that was really the first time that had been done in a kind of a blockbuster kind of thing. Um, and so I said, we're going to play against the player's expectations. We're going to make them think that, oh, they're doing the Call of Duty thing. They're going to kill me. Um, and I said, so you, you have to, we have to craft the encounter before this, um, the one that you're not working on, but you need to coordinate with the guy that's working on it um, so that you create space. Uh, you you make it so that everybody feels like they're Superman. You know, I'm I, I'm Rambo. I I can do anything. I'm blowing all this shit up. It's all me, right? Um, so that then when they get to this defend, and we uh we break that down. We break down this 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 like you know super empowerment thing and make them feel weak and make them and then they go oh, okay okay um. I'm going to I'm going to um die here I get it. Um and then we take that even further and we go longer with it. Like my, my bosses were like why is this going on for so long? <laughs> and I said I said you don't understand timing. Like <laughs> video games are like you study study horror, study uh, comedy. It's so funny people now with Jordan Peele they understand um the correlation between comedy and and horror. It's all timing. What happens before, in, you know, affects what happens after, and so, uh, you know, it, it's same with like this this whole defense scenario. We would have people, and um, and I would judge how long it took for someone to go, okay, this is too long, right? And then I take it back just a little, not a lot, just a little, um, and then. Part of it's also like your your buddies um, that are with you. You know, it's a whole coordinated thing. It's it's the encounter before the buddies that are with you are consistent throughout the entire game. They have certain personalities. One's always forward. One's always next to you. One's kind of hanging back. Um, they all have this yo Joe kind of attitude. So it's like, um, you know, I'm tier one. Check out my beard. I'm hard and. Um, and so when they start turning and going, oh shit, oh shit, man, game over, um, and this this whole breakdown of of your cover has just been tipped away for the past six minutes, you start to feel it. And I saw people, I saw players feel it. Um, we had you know consultants in, and they were like, holy crap, that's exactly what it was like um, when I was in the pit, man, in Afghanistan. And it, you know whether it was or not. It's, it made them feel that way, right? And the only way you can get there is by having an intent, by having a concept, a thought that this is what it's supposed to be. So then you can go, okay, um, rocket launcher in here. No, we're not going to have a rocket launcher in here. Well, why not? We have a rocket launcher in the game. And I said, because that doesn't fit the intent here. The intent is to strip away your power after you've been all, you know, Joe. Um, so giving you this big rocket launcher um, all of a sudden, you know, you feel empowered again. It's like you, you, know, you have to keep feeding back into what the intent is. So you have to have that intent to begin with. And this happens, this really goes for anything. It goes for even your, your simplest of indie games. What is your intent? If, uh, if it doesn't fit the intent, don't put it in. Seriously, it'll, it'll just drag, it'll drag you down or it'll water down what you're trying to do. Um, have you spinning your wheels? Uh, uh, you know, just either figure out how to rework it so it does make sense along with your intent, or don't put it in. It's okay because you know what? If you if you survive making this game, you get to make another one. 
uh, a great guy, again, uh, electronic art, you know, especially back in the day, Richard Hilleman, he was like a VP of production or something or other. And um, he came around one day and was like, oh, what are you doing? You know, because I was crunching. And um, I said, oh, I'm, I'm really working really hard to get this thing in, blah, 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 blah. And he said, save it for a sequel. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, what? And, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm this kid. I'm like 22. And I'm just like, what's this guy now? Um, and I'm just, I'm going to work my ass off and just get it in. You know, sequel. There's not going to be a sequel. And he said, you know, no, there won't be a sequel if you don't get this one done. But save it for the sequel. And that, you know, that stuck with me, especially after, of course, tipping and doing sequels. Um, is that um, not every idea is great. Not every di- idea is bad. Um, not every idea has to end up in your one magnum opus. There will be other games as long as you survive the one that you're working on. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I want another tangent. <laughs> no, so many, oh, man, so many things are uh, running through my head. <coughs> oh, excuse me. As you were I'm sorry, talking, it's, about. <laughs> it, you know, it, it, it's just one of those things. It's forty years, mm-hmm. you know, forty years of, of the of the same thing, largely on your mind. Um, it, um, yeah, it makes it easy to kind of go on the. <laughs> um, yeah. oh, two points I want to kind of build off what you were saying. So the first one we were just saying about intent. This is one of the things that I think I see as kind of like a misstep for a lot of people who do like game analysis or like video game critics is that there's this tendency that if I don't like something, then it must be bad. That you know, who can, you know, this is in a game and I don't like it, then this is obviously the fall of the developer, this is, you know, you know, the nail in the coffin, the smoking gun. But understanding, as you said, like, why this was put into the game. Does it fit the theme? Does it fit the tone and the aesthetic of this game? It's a lot harder, I think, than most people realize to be able to kind of get out of your own head when you're studying a video game, especially if you're studying a genre that you're not particularly, like, interested in or you don't know that well. And I've, like, mm-hmm. used this example before, like, I am terrible at every survival crafter. The Ark, Minecraft, uh, Long Dark, all those games. Rust. Yeah, Rust, of course, as well. Mm-hmm. I, I'm horrible at them. I typically don't play them. But I can still look at them and go, okay, this is why people play this. This is... You know, the stuff that I don't like is the exact reason why they have such huge audiences. That doesn't mean these games are bad. It just means it doesn't work for me. But I've watched videos, and I've seen this like, time and time again from, like, YouTubers and streamers where they'll play a game and they don't like it, and they'll, like, get obsessed about one point about this game that they don't like, and they turn it into, like... You know, this is like the uh, crime board, you know, like the conspiracy theory boards of why this game is horrible because I don't like this point. And they don't look at mm-hmm. anything else that goes with it. And it is a very hard habit, I feel, for a lot of people to break. It's one of the reasons why I say that I've been playing video games now for over 30 years. I didn't really start like looking at them like deeper until maybe 2012, 2013 when I started doing more of the game wisdom. So it kind of astonishes me when I go back to play classic games or pre-2000 games, trying to, like, understand, like, is this good or is is it good because I like it or is it good because the developer made it that way? Just that I can say, is this bad because I personally don't like it or is it bad because it's not fitting, like, what the developer wanted? And, like, to your point earlier about understanding why something is in a game. There are a lot, like, with the Vampire Survivor example, like, again, I have, for people watching this, if you are a regular on this channel, you know that I've played probably, I don't know, like, 80 to 100 of them, and most lately over the last, like, two years. There are people who will just say, well, I'll make it bigger and fancier. You know, it's Vampire Survivors, but it's, you know, 4K graphics. Or, mm-hmm. it's Vampire Survivors, but it's cowboys it's aliens it's bugs it's 
zombies. It's, again, you can pick any word you can think of, and you can make a vampire survivor game. But if you don't understand why something worked, why did they make it very simple? Why is the music so jazzy when you pick up a treasure chest in that game? If you just copy that wholesale, you're just going to end up with something that feels like just playing vampire survivors. Like, and I've said this before. Or, or less. <laughs> exactly. And I've said this, said this point so many times at this uh, point, but why should I play your version of a game when I still have their version of the game with all the updates, all the polish, all the awards and accolades with it? Why do I want to play your Mario Lake or your Doom Lake or your Vampire Survivor Lake? And most of the answers is no. Like, there's no reason because this product or this game right here does everything your game did but better. I, um, it's interesting. One, one side point is, you know, there's, um, I, I start seeing a lot of games, and especially platformers, um, um, people kind of whatever uh, whatever platformer they wanted, but like making them uh, hard. <laughs> and I say, like, why are you making it hard? Why are you doing the things that you're doing? You don't understand why we did what we did when we did it. Um, you know, part of the reason the Desert Strike is hard is because, you know, we had a short amount of time. Um, we took a long time to make the core engine to begin with. And um, it technically has four levels. Um, but, you know, each of those levels takes you, you know, an hour easily. Um, um, the sales and marketing guys came over and said, um, make sure it beats the rental, right? which meant back then that someone couldn't go to Blockbuster, grab a copy of Desert Strike, <laughs> play it in one night, and then return it, right? So why is Desert Strike at the level of difficulty that it is? Why is it tuned the way it is? A big part of it is because, don't you know, beat the rental, right? But nobody in 2020s with the internet and Google and, you know, just some sort of nostalgia goggles for making a new strike game um, is going to know that. They're just going to build things, you know, based upon their feels, which is good and bad. You really should know how and why someone, I mean, it's almost impossible to do, but there has to be some way, like having insight into their t intent uh, helps you immensely uh, for your choices on your game. Um, and yeah, I mean, part it's funny, um, I was talking to some friends probably a year ago now, or close to it, and they were like, okay, so you've studied um, Vampire Survivors, you understand it, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. No, so why don't you make your own and then make millions? And I said, because I won't make millions. Um, I could probably make my own right now, um, yeah. But um, it's not—it's it, not my jam right now, and I can't figure out how to do something that isn't Vampire Survivors. Like just making Vampire Survivors, um, and this was early as it as it really like kind of peaked, and people started latching on and started making their own, you know, uh, started making their own clones. So there's going to be a wave of clones. There's going to be so many. It's just it's going to be worse than like the last clones or something. It's just going to be everywhere. And I said, until I can actually think of um, why mine should exist, mm -hmm. I'm not going to spend the energy making it. You know, because especially I, I, I'm solo. I have a finite am amount of time. So I'm going to make something that. I'm into and I can get behind and that um, I can see end to end. One of the reasons my games, you know, I've been a firefighter, I've been franchise builder, all these things. And um, one of the reasons that my games turn out the way they do, um, i.e. actually finished and good, is because I can see them end to end. 
um, there's a point in, in development where um, I know everything. I mean, I, and, and that sounds like such a dickhead thing to say. Sorry, <laughs> but it's like, I mean, and but as the as the game director or whatever, you really should be able to see it end to end at some point. Um, but like, my team teammates would know. They came to me and they said, on level three, five, sector, blah, blah, over here past this one encounter, um, what happens? I would tell them what happens because I've dreamt and, and absorbed and lived and breathed this thing in my head to the point where I can at any moment just stop and play it. When I sit and think about, hey, Tony, why don't you go make millions making a survivor, uh, you know, uh, bullet hell, bullet heaven, whatever. Um, I can't pierce the veil of what it would be. What 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 is it besides a prettier version, a more polished version of Vampire Survivors? And it's just like, well, if I can't do that for myself, I sell it to someone else, right? Um, how am I going to survive getting through the development of this thing, whether it be three weeks, three months, or you know, or a year, however long it takes? Um, how am I going to survive that? <laughs> and then on the other end, have something that is great enough to convince people to leave survivor, you know, vampire survivors and come over to my house and play. Um, and so that's why there's a lot of games that I could make. There's, there, you know, uh, but the two things that's ever stopped me from making some, well, three things. One is resource. You know, if I don't have it, I don't have it. Like if I don't have a million dollars to make a new strike game or people telling me you should make a new legacy of Kane. Um, the, <laughs> uh, the amount of resources it would take even for a major studio to make a proper new Legacy of Cain, um, I'm cool with that. And, and, you know, if you really want it, it's called Darksiders 2. So, you know, go play that. <laughs> uh, but um, besides the resources, you know, it, it, it's like, what, what am I going to spend my time doing? And if I'm spending my time chasing um, something that I really kind of not behind 100%, then it's it's a waste of my time. Uh, I could wake up tomorrow and have the greatest vampire survivor bullet heaven idea, and then I will make that because I I, I crack the code. But until I do that, it, it it's it, it's a uh, it's a waste of my finite resources to do that. Um, yeah, but and, uh, oh. sorry. Oh no, go ahead. Um, and yeah, like like I said, like or I guess I already said that, like you know, people making these things, digging the crate, so you know why why we did something. Why the why the hell is Vester's quest so freaking hard? Because the um because the producer played it so many times that he didn't care if, if it was so freaking hard, he was fine with it. And he, and he said, you know, as long as someone in the building can get past it, we're shipping it. Um, you know, so sometimes you really have to take a look back and, and, and it's your job, you know, that's, a, that's one of the things I think a lot of people um, who go from gamer and hobbyist to, you know, developer indie or not is um i don't think they that 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 switch doesn't flip that it's their job now it can be fun it can be what you've always wanted to do and you should have that passion please do because we see lots of passionless apathetic incorporated stuff out there already but understand it's your job like it, it, so take your job seriously like you know analyze other things and and, and really a uh, buddy of mine you know used to um uh, say why do you play these crappy games as a matter of fact i still have friends that say why are you spending time with that <laughs> crappy game and i said um somebody made this somebody put their effort into it and put it out right um so i'm going to give it some time the um why they thought this was good enough to go out why, why they thought, yep, that's what I want to put out, and there it is, right? Um, and nowadays, um, the extra layer on top of that is I look at um, crappy games or, you know, whatever game that isn't the hotness, and I look at them and I go, oh, 
thank you. Thank you for spending all of your time and money doing R&D for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Because it is time consuming. If you're if you're doing your job right, it's time consuming to sit there and analyze, really analyze uh, a game um, or any any sort of uh, entertainment product, and, and to go, okay, this works, this does not, right? Um, uh, and like I said, you can have all the ideas you want. Uh, if you embark on executing a wrong idea, for lack of a better term, you know. Um, you're going to end up eating that time or it can take down your whole project. But imagine if someone else embarked on that idea or something close to it, and maybe they failed. Um, or maybe that part of the that idea that you had, that, that part works within the game that failed. So, like, I'm very holistic when I look at these things. I just, I, like, you know, I... I Look at them mechanics wise. I look at them aesthetically. I look at I just keep breaking it down, breaking it down. And I mean, it 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 does kind of in some ways ruin some games um, for me. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Um. Just like just like the same with movies. There are certain movies that I'll watch and I'll be like, this would be amazing if I wasn't so cinematography literate. Like um. I I think uh, Shutter Island is a great movie. I have grown up on thrillers. I, I've been watching thrillers and horror. Um, literally, I, I saw uh, uh, The Shining when I was eight. And so um, when it comes to those type of movies um, and cinematography and everything, I'm, I'm, I'm just a little too cinema literate. Mm -hmm. And so I see things coming. Um, it took... And so I watched I watched Shutter Island, and I'm all, it's a really good movie. It'd be an amazing movie if I didn't know what the hell I was looking at, if <laughs> I was a little. Um, and then, um, because I'm the type of person I am, I'll actually go back and watch things over and over again. Um, if I've watched Shutter Island enough times, actually, where I start getting into, like, the mechanics of it and all this, and I start seeing things I really, really enjoy, um, and that's, that's, that worked for me, you know? Um, and then there's movies that I have, like, nothing. Like, they're just entertainment, and I'm in it. Um, but it, it's like that with games, too, you know? Um, a lot of games I approach, and I'm just sitting there, and I can feel the designer on the other end. And then I have to make this decision of whether I want to stay in that headspace um, where I'm analyzing it instead of being in it. Um, Oh, excuse me. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of make those decisions on the fly. It doesn't mean that I dislike something because I'm not fully immersed in it. It just means that um, the mechanical execution is, is overriding the, say, narrative execution or something like that. Um, but again, I, I, you know, I'm fairly pragmatic, so I can look at something and go, that's fine. That's fine with me. Um, for some other people, though, it becomes a death nail. It's like you're saying, you know, someone sitting there analyzing some one random thing and then going and then drawing their crazy diagram about why the, here's why the entire product sucks. Well, it's like, first of all, suck is objective, uh, subjective, not objective. Um, and second of all, you have, you have created a line and will feed into that line to to justify you know your 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 overall opinion of this thing um, instead of actually being a little more objective about it, especially if you're a video game a analyst or, or or a designer or something, you really have to um, at some point take yourself out of it. Mm -hmm. you know you have to like step back and go, it's, that's not me. That's not me playing that thing. This thing made a la carte for me. Sorry, Internet 2023. The world is not a la carte for you. Um, this thing was made by many people for many people. So now I can take the 30,000-foot uh, view of it like I should be if I'm doing my job. If you're not doing your job, then you know, rage all you want, whatever. Just don't do it under the pretense of being some sort of professional analysis person or game designer, because 
Um, there's nothing professional about about uh, agenda mining. Yeah. And um, to your point about playing like all kinds of games, like every week I do an indie stream where I just play any game sent to me by any developers, and mm. I have played the gambit of games for sure. I have played. From like like a student just sending me a game saying, "There's my first game I made. Here it is on itch. <laughs> Would you like to try it?" Yeah, sure. And as you said, like like one of the things like people always like make fun of me is that I will probably spend more time playing like a game that I'm not enjoying more than a game I'm enjoying or I love because I kind of want to see where that rabbit hole goes. I want to see like, okay, where is this game? Like, yes, like the jumping is weird, or you know. Why is, like, the screen, like, giving me, like, a photo sensitivity uh, for every menu? I, I want to know why they did that. Like, what was, like, the intent of it? And, like, everyone's, like, on, like, the stream saying, Josh, just move on already. You don't have to keep playing. And, like, no, I want to know what is... I need to solve this mystery of this game. And... Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. And it's... It's a different mindset than gamers, whether you know whether they call themselves casual or hardcore. Uh, gamers just want to be in the entertainment. Um, they're not they're not asking questions like why why did this end up this way, um, mm -hmm. and not everybody has to. Um, but again, if if you're a professional, um, if if it's your gig, if you're you know then you should. You should stop and, and go why or spend that extra moment going like, what is wrong with this? <laughs> and actually not just raging and going, this sucks, but actually trying to figure out what is it about this thing that is not working for me, right? Mm -hmm. um, what it, and, and, and I choose my words carefully. You know, what is it uh, that's not working for me is important. Um, because I recognize that um, there are a lot of games that um, I don't like, I won't play, but millions of other people play them all the time. Um, it's strange to me, actually, that these people who, that are part of the millions of other people playing something can't, like, they can't be apathetic and go, oh, okay, I get it. Um, that game is not for me, but this game is for me. Instead, it's like, well, the game that's for me, you know, is popular, and you don't like it, um, so something's wrong with you. Like, no, no, that's just that's just not how it works. <laughs> that's not really how it works. I mean, in an echo chamber, that's how it works. But in, in the real world, that's not really how it works. Um, and once you kind of open up your mind that way, um, as a gamer, you can start to discover more games, you know, newer, different games, uh, versus the ones that are that you thought were your niche. But come to find out, you would just close your mind off. And as a as a um, developer, um, it's it's you know it, it it it's brain food that you can utilize to uh, to create you know your game, your voice. Uh, by understanding that uh, not everything is about you. There's there's games that I've made that have things in them. And I'm like, I I wouldn't have done that by myself. You know, that wouldn't just be me. Or that's not how I play something, you know, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but I recognize that the thing that I'm making I want I want as many people as as I can to play it. I want as many people to to um, you know experience and embrace my craft. And that means that from time to time there's going to be something that isn't necessarily what I would do or want 100%. And that, that even in my solo stuff there's there's a few things where I'm like mm. well I was going to change this, but so many other people seem to dig it. So, okay, I will, I will leave it or I will nudge it a little um, to be 
a little more acceptable uh, to me, but without alienating the you know the people that actually actually loved it. Um, and that's the way that's the way that I started. You know, because I got immediate feedback making games in class, um, and then um, in in the eighties. Um, making stuff and then taking it to user group meetings and having, you know, it's like a LAN party, you know, except for <laughs> without the LAN. So you get immediate response. Right? And I learned to react to that and to, um, and to uh, let some things go that I was planning on changing. Um, and then there's a long period in my uh, career where I kind of got away from it. I mean, I still... I still take in feedback. I still there's still things that are in in like I said probably in every game there's something that I wouldn't have done myself just off the top of my head, but um, but slightly different when you're working in giant teams and and schedules and all that stuff. And then back to being solo, I'm like back to okay, um, like I I put out BPM boy and I'm like it's just not enough levels. I'm sitting there looking at insane games like n plus right which is a platformer um it's and it has you know hundreds of levels and of course part of that's because it's it's 2d mm-hmm. and they had a team so a 2d platformer physics or not um is a lot easier to generate levels um and tune them than a 3d platformer mm-hmm. and so um you know, but I'm sitting there looking at, at at these games, and I'm going, yeah, they've got hundreds of levels. I've only got, I think, I have like 40 now, right? Um, and I was like, oh my god, I'm gonna put out more levels. I, I, I don't know, but I have to get the game done. <laughs> and I shipped the game uh, on this crazy machine called the Atari VCS, um, which is a, a, a console that nobody knows exists except for us Atari heads. Um, but it's great because I can put the game out. Um, the community is quite vocal, um, and I literally, it, it, between the data that I can mine from the game um, and the community, uh, having a relationship with the, you know the the you know four to five hundred some odd people um, that that talk um, directly, you know, getting that feedback. Is invaluable. There's places I've been at that that spend way more money on on smaller uh, user group uh, or um, uh, you know kind of uh, consumer group uh, feedback group and and you know bringing in influencers and all that jibber jabber. Um, while I'm getting actually from from the people who actually enjoy my game or don't enjoy my game, and I can take their feedback and I can go okay. Um, uh, this, this is a trend. This needs to be fixed. This is a trend. This is great. Don't touch that. Oh, um, look at this trend. Look at this. Only only 20% of my players have gotten through all 40 levels. So don't spend time making more levels. Spend time figuring out why only 20% of the people finished you know, your, your game. And oh. so... Mm-hmm. It's invaluable and, to actually listen. All right. The cast is going to wrap up here, but our discussion was not finished. We went for almost three hours. I know the chance of someone sitting through an entire lengthy discussion like this is pretty low. So we're going to be splitting this up into two parts. For part two, we're going to be discussing more about what Tony is working on and a lot more about learning game design and pouring lessons and tips he's learned over the years. With that said, do the YouTube and self check out our Discord and our Patreon for our game recommendation newsletter and our goal for more daily streaming. And with that, I hope you enjoyed this part. Let me know what you think down below, and I'll see everyone next week for the conclusion of this fantastic conversation.